So today we have two entrepreneurs in the clean energy industry with us, Dr. Jayantika Soni and Dr. Abhishek Kumar. Dr. Jayantika will be speaking first, followed by Dr. Abhishek. Dr. Jayantika is the co-founder and chief technological officer of Resync Technologies Private Limited. Resync provides an intelligent energy management platform for smart cities and systems with multiple energy sources. They use a combination of machine learning models and deep technical knowledge of energy systems to ensure system efficiency, optimize performance, and continuous savings. After a few rounds of investments, Resync became a portfolio company of venture funds like August One, SG Innovate, and Prestia. Dr. Jayantika, like most of you, did her undergraduate and an IIT in the field of electrical engineering. Later, she went on to pursue PhD in energy and power at the National University of Singapore, where she gained a deep technical knowledge in developing control algorithms for energy systems. She met her co-founder at Entrepreneur First, a London-based acceleration program backed by Reid Hoffman. So without wasting any more time, I would like to invite Dr. Jayantika to share her entrepreneurial experience in the clean energy sector. Please keep the questions coming. We will also be providing certificates for the most interesting questions. Since there are two speakers for this session, kindly mention the name of the speaker followed by the question. Dr. Jayantika, please. Thank you, Sarvesh. Uh, and thank you uh, to all the three universities for inviting me for the call. Uh, webinar the talk. Um, I think Sarvash covered most of my entrepreneur journey. Uh, but what I'll do is like I have a small deck. Um, I'll present to you what we do at Racing, uh, talk a bit about about background, talk a bit about um, what do we mean by AI driven energy cloud, right? So um, have your questions ready. Uh, happy to answer them at the end of the session right okay um can you guys see my screen yes we can okay i'll just go into the full screen mode okay. yeah okay uh so racing uh is a brainchild of emmer and mine uh which was started almost three and a half four years ago uh we do AI-driven energy cloud, specifically focusing on distributed energy resources. Right. So the current energy market, as all of you have some background knowledge of it, is going through a drastic transformation. Right? We have more renewables, we have more digitalization in this ecosystem, we have more energy storage, and then definitely a lot of data surrounding it and a lot of hype about ML and um, AI in the process, right? Uh, data sits at the key of it. We believe um, using efficient algorithms and efficient real-time control, we can improve um, the overall energy usage. We can improve the efficiency by at least 30% um, uh, just by using data alone. Uh, how we do that is using an innovative, reliable, affordable um, algorithm that are customizable in nature. So uh, I'll first dive deeper into uh, how we came about this solution, how we came about solving this problem as well. So we see a lot of proliferation of distributed energy, whether in terms of solar on rooftop, electric vehicles, smart buildings, etc. Now, when you have these kind of large distributed energy uh, assets in the ecosystem, it becomes really hard to manage them. It's much easier to manage a centralized power plant far away than to manage solar on every rooftop. This becomes a problem for the grid. This becomes uh, a problem for the end user as well, that how to ensure that they are getting the best value for their power. So how we started is uh, by deploying IoT layer of solutions, which interacted with um, energy assets such as solar, diesel generators, batteries, um, grid pricing, etc., in real time, uh, that can independently work um, to ensure that the system operate at the maximum efficiency possible, right? At the optimal point of energy and the lowest cost of energy as well. Uh, 
then we transmit that data to the cloud. On cloud, we do multiple things, uh, including running multiple machine learning models and processing the data that we're collecting from the IoT devices and then visualizing it to our customers. Right. So when we talk about multiple machine learning models, they primarily include three things. Uh, one is forecasting how the energy is supposed to be generated, how it will be consumed, and what are the pricing that can influence the um, energy consumption uh, behavior or uh, buying of the energy from the electricity market. Second thing we also do is disaggregation of the load. So by collecting one single data point um, of information, we try to disaggregate this uh, loads into smaller appliance level components like from air conditioning, from uh, water heating, from um, other cooling infrastructure. And then Third thing is predictive maintenance, how the assets are performing on ground as they are distributed in nature, there usually is no manpower or limited manpower around them. So how you can make sure that the operation and maintenance of these assets are carried out without a reliance on just manpower alone. Can you use electrical signatures? Can you use um, the know-how of the power systems to determine uh, when to carry out the maintenance, when to carry out um, the improvements in them, right? Uh, and all these information collected from the real-time IoT device um, given by the ML algorithms is provided to the user in a very simple, very easy to understand um, knowledge, right? So there are, if you think of it, there are actually three major components of this product. So my background is on power systems so and real-time controls, where we started initially by developing IoT and robust control systems which are running on the ground. Then we slowly integrated ML, um, data science aspects of it. And then a window, a window to all of this comes from the software itself, where we uh, provide the visualization, where we allow the user to provide their insights to so set up their own goals on how they want their energy assets to run, and then uh, make it a seamless closed loop system, right? Like where the information flows in seamlessly from the energy assets to the user and the user preferences back to the energy assets. Uh, we do that in primarily um, two categories. You see five over here, but we try to classify them in two. One is for the microgrids and another is for the smart cities. So in microgrids, we include assets like renewables. Uh, we include assets like uh, distributed microgrids, which can be your part of on the islands um, or can be on telecom towers, which are essentially nanogrids with multiple sources of energy in the uh, ecosystem. And then on the smart city size, we uh, encompass two things is on the smart buildings where we provide real time analytics um, and load disaggregation of the consumption and a digital twin of sorts. And then is on the electric vehicle and mobility, which is a bit nascent as of right now uh, where it is implemented. Uh, from day one, there are like, uh, we know that there are quite a bit of companies providing control system that work very well with their um, ecosystem. Uh, so we created a plug and play solution that can work with all tier one brands of inverters, uh, all tier one brands of hardware providers and um, can be integrated seamlessly. Uh, we can, uh, we have actually used the COVID uh, time to deploy our solutions as a complete plug and play solution. So we shipped up uh, devices and we remotely onboarded a lot of sites in 2020 alone, uh, completely remotely end to end uh, with just working with the technicians on ground, right? And this is the future uh, from what we see that there would be uh, a lot less manual interventions needed if we can analyze and predict when the uh, maintenance need to be carried out, a lot of uh, money could be saved on these things alone. We manage um, over 350 million data points um, across seven countries, across over 600 megawatt um, capacity, uh, energy capacity in solar assets, where we primarily work in a B2B environment. That's where um, our uh, proposition came from. And this is one of the learnings that we had from Entrepreneur First as well, that why to target B2B. Um, it's a much harder market to crack 
but it's a more sustainable business for us where we are providing deep technical solutions uh, which are useful both to the end user but primarily to our customers who understand the value of money spent on operation and maintenance uh, money spent on improving energy efficiency uh, pays off in the longer run uh, and we talk we tend to target a bigger size and projects and that's where um, our focus on providing deep technical solution to in a b2b space has been uh, a learning from our time in our uh, accelerator. Um, I will not go into details about this because this is a uh, this is more about what we do, and this presentation is more focused on our entrepreneurial journey, right? And then we delve into building system. When we talk about distributed energy or energy in general, a lot of focus is always on where you are getting your energy from. Are you getting it from the grid? Are you getting it from the solar? Are you getting it from the battery? But why is this energy being provided is the need for consumption. And 40 to 50% of the energy demand in cities is actually uh, from the buildings alone. Uh, buildings are the biggest source of consumer. And we need to look at consumption solution where we identify how buildings operate how we can make them energy efficient, how we can make them smarter, and how we can make them comfortable for the end user. Um, so what we do at Resync is kind of like a demand side management where uh, we provide um, not just the real time monitoring of the energy asset, but go into uh, control of um, energy consumption systems, such as your cooling loads, et cetera. And that kind of provides the feedback loop. If you can estimate how much you're consuming, you can estimate how much you should be generating and then provide that information to the grid in a feedback loop system. Or depending on the pricing, you can uh, lower your demand or increase your demand uh, depending on your energy uh, expenditure goals. Right. So uh, it's not looking at just one component and optimizing for that, but looking at the bigger picture of uh, DERs and how we optimize for them. I'll just skip this over. This is not really good. Okay. So yeah, uh, let's me talk a bit about the team. So Amir and I um, met through Entrepreneur First um, around four years ago. Uh, both of us are from energy background. I did my PhD in from National University of Singapore where I worked on power systems uh, and control systems for the power systems. Uh, during that time, I've been an electrical engineer for almost a decade now. Amir also comes from renewable energy background. He used to work for REC Solar. And both of us came together and we discussed a lot of problems that are being currently plaguing the energy industry. And we looked at the issue of how distributed energy um, can be a boon or can be a bane to the grid systems. It is inevitable uh, due to the drastically dropping prices of renewables that we will have a lot more DERs in the ecosystem. With a lot more DERs, either there would be uh, punitive restrictions that are going to come from the grid that you can only export limited amount of energy to the grid, or you can um, you have to mandate uh, um, uh, mandatory meet the energy consumption that you're going to uh, take from the uh, grid. Right. Uh, and these kind of regulations are going to come a bit later, but a lot of problems for the ER owners is once their assets are installed, they have no insight into how they are running and uh, how they are running or they need to deploy continuously manpower to monitor them, which turns out to be a bit more expensive. Um, uh, and how do you optimize in, uh, your manpower deployment? How do you optimize your resources? And that's where Resync was born, that we will start with the ER optimization uh, using uh, control algorithms, using machine learning. And then we added the SaaS part where we could visualize all this information, all these insights that we are generating that, and we can translate them in an easy to understand and dollar value terms uh, to our users, right? So yeah. Um, okay. Uh, that's about it. Uh, it I'll just like quickly uh, stop sharing and like just give you two cents on entrepreneurship is not easy. 
but there are a lot of problems that the traditional industry does not solve and that's where entrepreneurs are born energy is a very conservative industry it has been um but it is the industry which needs more innovation we are at the forefront of solving the problem of climate change and we should definitely um make use of our knowledge make use of our uh, capabilities in helping do that having said that uh, we are hiring as well um if you're interested uh, check us out on our website uh, feel free to reach to me on linkedin happy to answer any questions you have uh, thank you so much for having me i'll be here later for more questions thank you jentika like yeah we'll be doing the questions together with both the panelists uh bitel could you give the spotlight to me yeah thank you so thank you jentika this that was a really great uh talk we now have dr avishek a co-founder and ceo of vflow tech private limited v is vflow tech is a spin off from nanyang university in singapore capitalizing on 7 years of research to address key issues faced by flow batteries vflow is reinventing reinventing vanadium redox flow technology with a vision to develop the cheapest and most scalable vanadium redox flow batteries in the world vflow uses a unique approach of industry focused research to deliver a long lasting and reliable storage solution based on user feedback and industry trends avishek holds a master degree in microelectronics from tum germany and a doctorate degree in electrical and computer engineering from national university of singapore Avishek has a deep background in manufacturing and has detailed domain knowledge of the renewable energy industry. Dr. Avishek was one of the chief architects for developing the efficiency PERC mono modules and also has played a key role in the commercialization of the half cut PERC mono module. He is actively involved in consultation and development of solar plus energy projects across the region and has contributed to over 600 megawatt of renewable energy projects in singapore i'm sure by now all of you are eager to listen to dr avishek without any further ado i would like to call dr avishek to take us through yet another inspiring story dr avishek please uh you are muted sir thank you sir please uh, i would like since this topic is about entrepreneurial journey I would like to highlight uh, more about uh, my journey, why I became an entrepreneur, and then I am happy to share more about our technology than going through what we sell. Uh, so I am a hardcore renewable person. I did my PhD in solar uh, because solar energy at that time had many problems, and the problem was low efficiency. And my thesis was responsible in improving defects in multicast line uh, thin film, and, and which is also uh, the founding a uh, building block of multicast line wafers. and uh, part of my work uh, has helped uh, silicon efficiency go from 14 to 17% and then uh, after my phd i joined uh, rdc solar where i was instrumental in developing next uh, generation technology i did a uh, work on developing a uh, half cut perk uh, multi and mono technology which became commercial and it is a household name today uh, after uh, developing i felt at rdc that i was not adding much value to the company because on technology front it was getting up there uh, and the uh, renewable energy industry was growing uh, at a much faster pace and there is a gap uh, if you look in the region uh, particularly in india or in south east asia so i left the company to uh, start a company called sun connect the idea was to connect people in solar through knowledge and i have worked uh, uh, with leading manufacturing firm like tata power solar uh, adani and uh, we worked on to improve manufacturing in india at the same time uh, project development was uh, uh, happening in solar and uh, worked with a uh, large corporate like bharat magnelli renew power and in malaysia we worked with a company called tnc i was instrumental uh, in uh, initiating large scale solar uh, early projects in malaysia in 2017 uh, since then i have worked over uh, 800 to 900 megawatt of solar projects uh, where uh, we have done due diligence improve the quality of installation and improve the yield of the system uh, during that time uh, i felt uh, that the last decade belong to uh, solar and renewables the cost of renewable has dropped uh, so drastically that today the cheapest form of energy is solar uh, and going forward uh, the the problem with renewable is that it is intermittent so means that uh, when you 
uh, want it, it's, it cannot be there. So like in Singapore, uh, we have uh, roughly about 300 megawatt of solar, but it can easily go zero with the cloud coming up. That creates a disturbance. So you cannot rely and scale it up uh, a lot along unless until you have a, a bridge. And that bridge is basically batteries. Also, what we are seeing uh, is that uh, we have intermittent energy, which is renewables. We are also are seeing a demand of, int I mean, uh, intermittent demand, which is like EV. You don't know when somebody will come and unplug. Um, I mean, not it's not a problem right now because the percentage is so low. But in five years with our aggressive push, we don't know how to control the demand. So to manage this intermittent supply and demand, the only bridge is battery. So we will need a lot and lot of battery technology, that is for sure. And uh, fortunately, uh, there is a lot more uh, uh, technology that is happening. And lithium ion being the dominant technology uh, in terms of energy density, in terms of mobility, its use is restricted to EVs. So the problem uh, with lithium ion when you want to uh, use for long hours is that uh, it becomes hot. And everybody uh, in this room who, who have used phone uh, must have figured that when you talk for a, an hour, it is really hot. Uh, that is a phenomenon is called thermal runaway. Uh, whereas uh, uh, almost all energy storage technology uh, degrades very fast. So when you have anybody experiencing an old laptop in which is more than three years of old, you will find out that the battery dies, which is a performance degradation. So imagine if you are powering a building or if you are powering a city, we need a reliable and continuous source of energy. That's why uh, I met uh, Arjun who was working on this technology for last seven years and improving the technology. Uh, we want to develop a technology that is reliable, that lasts long, that is 100% recyclable, and uh, that technology is called flow battery. Uh, the technology had many issues. Uh, efficiency was low, thermal precipitation was there, and uh, where Arjun uh, uh, did seven years of research to improve it. And uh, we got together to commercialize it, and since uh, then we have uh, built an industrial scale system one of our battery is powering JTC Cleantech one building, which is just outside NTU. So you feel free to uh, uh, come here. And it's a good demonstration because the battery is managing solar and it's and used for variable load like EV, car park, and lift uh, loads are being powered by battery. Uh, and we have proven that uh, whatever we are demonstrating in lab is working on a, on a large scale product. And since then uh, uh, we have got huge interest uh, from customers in uh, Australia, in Japan, we have sold few system in, in, in Japan. And recently we are now working uh, to decarbonize the whole Pulauvin Island, which uh, is heavily dependent on, on diesel. So we are working with a leading developer to basically put a megawatt hour battery and power the island 24 seven on, on solar plus, plus battery. So these are the few projects that we, have, we are doing currently. And we are seeing a huge interest uh, from large developer to club uh, uh, use our battery. That's our status uh, uh, of our journey. Uh, as far as the journey is concerned, I mean, it, it uh, is very, very difficult, uh, but it's rewarding. Uh, I left because I wanted to add more value, which I am adding, uh, creating solution. Uh, every startup has its own journey or every entrepreneur has its own journey. Ours is, uh, uh, is, a, is a huge uh, hardware come, which is in any, any in energy sector, it's rewarding. It's not uh, uh, as exponential as software that goes. So we have to have a patience. So it took us uh, three years to build our, our software and we didn't have much support from investors. So we went uh, to government agencies, uh, which uh, helped us. So we got a first grant from Tamasek to build a prototype and then Enterprise Singapore supported us. And then uh, we recently uh, uh, got a grant from a Korean government to basically convert a gas station into EV charging with our battery, which is about $2 million. So we have been uh, relying on, on all sorts of funding support uh, and demonstrate our technology. Now we are looking to expand uh, our technology. I'm happy to explain. I mean, I didn't uh, show the slide deck. Uh, it was not, I mean, uh, it does not make much sense. But I'm happy uh, to discuss any issues or if you have any under, uh, any questions on our energy storage technology, feel free to reach out to me and uh, happy to have any questions. Thank you, sir. Yeah, we can take questions now, I think. Uh, V3, like even Jayantika can answer questions. I think there are a few questions for Jayantika. Uh, yeah. Yes, thank you. Uh, so I think there are a few questions for Jayantika, ma'am. Uh, 
Firstly, uh, there is this question that is Resync planning to move away from hardware or is it happy with the hybrid of hardware and software? Um, very good question, right? Like, so um, the reason we created the hardware is uh, because we felt that the technology that are present right now does not fulfill the need of providing the close feedback loop system. So we are uh, planning to move away from hardware or provide our hardware like as a plug-in kind of agent that can be used with any of the IPCs, any of the um, asset providers, which will take care of the real-time control and which will take care of the IoT connectivity. We already have three ways of streaming data into our ML models, which is using APIs, using FTP servers, and then over MQTT, which we currently use to integrate the data. So uh, we are hardware agnostic. Uh, we are going to be moving towards less hardware. Um, and yeah, we might be looking into licensing the software that we have for real-time control. Thank you. Yeah, I think that answers the question. Now, uh, one more question. I would, I would like to go on to Dr. Abhishek. So one question for you is, is carbon footprint of flow batteries or your batteries in particular or is it lesser than the lithium ion battery? It's uh, one fifth of lithium ion battery. We use 100% recyclability and there are enough papers to support it. Uh, uh, basically every component that we use, use are recyclable. The vanadium that uh, uh, we use, uh, the first thing about our battery is that we don't consume it. So the energy is uh, changed, I mean, energy is transferred by changing state. So vanadium is a transition metal uh, where it can stay stable in four state, V2, V3, V4, V5. So the energy is changed by just changing state. So you are not consuming anything unlike lithium. And so you can use it, reuse it as, as long as you want. And then uh, other elements are recycled at very, very less energy uh, consumption. So it's actually one fifth carbon footprint of than what a lithium ion does. I would actually like to add on that question. What about the price? Sir? Like, is it cheaper or more expensive than? Uh, so pr pricing is something uh, as is a factor of scale. If you see lithium ion uh, uh, was much more expensive five years ago where it is. So uh, we have not reached that scale. So we are about 20% uh, expensive than lithium ion, but we are like five times more uh, uh, life. So we are seeing a cost of ownership uh, 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 drastically down. That's why we are becoming, uh, I mean, a hot shot with uh, large IPV players and it makes sense to invest. I mean, and uh, I can give you one thing that uh, if we reach the scale of one tenth of where the lithium ion is, we will be cheaper than lithium ion solution upfront in CapEx also. And uh, the 20% what we are doing is we are now creating innovative models. So as I mentioned that vanadium is not consumed, it's a metal that is an asset that you have. So we are trying to create an, uh, a financing agency in, uh, uh, in somewhere in Europe that can lease vanadium. So the upfront uh, cost can be uh, taken into CapEx and OPEX over 25 years of time. So it makes much more sense. Thank you. Another question for Jayantika would be, uh, Gaurav says that, thank you for a great presentation. And he would be interested to know who are your typical clients. So could you explain more about your target market? Yeah, so our target market, as I explained, uh, we target mostly other businesses, which could be renewable energy developers, which could be battery uh, owners, uh, microgrid owners, and uh, smart building operators, right? Like, so, um, companies who use them. These are some of our typical mark, uh, target markets. We are also working with campuses. So we have a few deployments uh, in NTU that are coming up as well. Uh, we are a collaborative for the Energy Market Authority grant with the National University of Singapore. Uh, we, have, we are partnering with Pangcha Group in Thailand for their smart campus at Chiang Mai University, right? So, it's, uh, and then we work with renewable energy developers like Clean Tech Solar, um, Semcorp, uh, Vipgyar Energy, et cetera, who are completely solar companies, but are pretty interested in how to improve their energy efficiency, et cetera. So yeah, these are some of the target customers. I think one more follow-up question Gaurav asked is, will you be providing leasing models? Do you provide leasing models also? Yeah. Yeah, so our hardwares are very inexpensive. Uh, that can be completely absorbed inside the OPEX. So that can run as a perpetual, as a service model, uh, both software and the, uh, the, IP, the IPC, the IoT device edge solution that we provide with it, right? So 
uh, it's completely as a service model. Uh, we provide the maintenance, we provide the warranties, everything behind it. Thank you. I think I hope it answers Gaurav's question. So I think there are a few more questions for Dr. Abhishek. So uh, one more question would be, uh, what are your views on hybrid energy systems, say supercapacitors with, uh, with AGM uh, flow batteries? Actually, we are working with a large high corporation on that. So uh, we believe that there's a market for hybrid uh, batteries. And we are working with a hybrid case for uh, lithium ion and, and flow battery. So there are use cases uh, and it makes sense if you have to do fast charging. Uh, and and uh, uh, for example, uh, we did a project uh, uh, for a large uh, refinery where they had an inductive load and uh, that gives about five times as high current, uh, sorry, 15 times as high as current and super capacitor was required. So there is a market for hybrid uh, and uh, it, uh, we see a good market. So we are also uh, working on those, those, those lines. Uh, and he, and as, 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 as I mentioned, uh, uh, the funny thing about energy storage technology is that you need to find right technology with right application to get the right economics. So if you have a, a scenario where you have multiple application, it makes sense to go hybrid. Okay, I hope that answers this question. I think one more question for Jayantika is, what are your views on Bosch Phantom Edge? It's my question. Are you familiar with it? I am not very familiar with Bosch's Phantom Edge. Uh, what I can say for us, uh, uh, there are a lot of IoT platforms out there, right? That can provide the integration, that can provide uh, even your Amazon and your Google provide a IoT integration uh, that you can set it up yourself. What we do better is energy. We understand that very well. We understand what are the power system limitation and we understand uh, how energy efficiency can be improved. It's not just about taking the data from a sensor, taking the data from a device and just showing it and visualizing it. It's actually taking actionable insights and actionable action on that, right? So we take real-time control actions. We, pro we dig dive, uh, deep dive into the component level analytics and we bring it in a very simple manner. So I did not go deeper into my slides, but you would have seen a heat map kind of thing where the user can easily understand where the sites are going wrong or how they need to improve it with analytics, like whether it's a dust coverage, whether it's a fault, whether it's a, um, a string level analysis that they need to carry out. So it becomes very, very simple. It's focused on the energy rather than like encompassing IoT as one because all IoTs are not created equal. All right. I think, uh, one more question for Dr. Abhishek would be, are the Vandium batteries based on only physical or chemical or both process to deliver energy? Also, what would be a typ typical lifetime of such a battery? Ask Vinay Nawan. Uh, uh, I'm not sure if I get the question correct, but I can, I can answer uh, based on the uh, surgeon. So Vanadium batteries uh, basically uh, are, uh, uh, I mean, uh, it's a technology where power and energy are separate. So it's a, something like a fuel cell concept. So you have a power, which for example, uh, uh, is taken building, which is a hundred kilowatt power. So hundred kilowatt, we need stack and we need energy. So how long we need to run this hundred kilowatt, five hours, six hours. And that is the amount of vanadium liquid that we need. Uh, and the energy transfer happens by the liquid is flown through this uh, uh, power stack, which is nothing but uh, activated carbon. And there's electron transfer membrane where uh, when you move the vanadium two across this activated carbon, it releases an electron it becomes an EM3 and then through a membrane is transferred. Uh, so it is a mix of a, a, a power stack and, uh, and a tank. So basically two things, you have a tank and you have a power stack and that's how energy is released and, 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 and the energy is, is gotten back. The lifetime of this technology is, some people say 20,000 cycle, there is no limit on vanadium. Uh, the membrane has a lifetime. So some membrane has 10,000 to 15,000 15, cycle. So if you talk about 10,000 cycle and if, if you are doing a cycling every day, the lifetime is about 27 years. But uh, 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 vanadium has an infinite lifetime. So if you are able to change the membrane, you can refurbish the batteries at 30% cost. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and also he asked about the life cycle. How much do you 25 years. So you can safely say 25 years. Uh, in terms of cycles, it's about 10,000 cycle. More than 10,000 cycle. All right. Thank you. I think one more question from Gaurav to Jayantika would be, can racing systems also review building energy consumptions? I think you have mentioned that and also improve and suggest 
improvements in data analytics to enhance energy efficiency is what part of us. Yeah. So uh, the second pillar uh, of our product is smart buildings and smart cities, where it focuses on building energy consumption and how to improve their energy efficiency. So we do a few things. One is the real-time control of the energy consumption assets, such as the HVAC systems. Uh, and second part is load disaggregation. By collecting one single point of data um, from your centralized energy meter, we can break it down into appliance level information as well, right? So this can be used uh, to improve it. We have actually done that in a residential setting around three months ago. There was a documentary on the Channel News Asia where we presented just by nudging the user alone, just by providing them the information, we could improve, uh, reduce their energy consumption actually by uh, somewhere between 15 to 40 percent, uh, depending on the user needs, right? Like So just by nudging, you can reduce your energy consumption. Uh, with an active control loop in the system, we can definitely improve it much beyond that. All right. So I think we are done with questions. But one question I have to both of you is what actually motivated you? Or why did you take the leap of faith to actually leave your job and get into this? As, as Jayanti mentioned, it's a conservative sector and it is developing. Yes, it has, it has the potential, but what made you you know, leave up your careers and be an entrepreneur and take that risk in this industry, especially. For me, uh, it was to add more value. I mean, uh, I know nothing but renewable. And uh, I was, I thought that uh, the value that I am getting at a company, except of increasing my salary and the knowledge that I have already used, uh, I can use it uh, to scale uh, uh, much more and, uh, and contribute much more to the renewable energy industry in the region. And there was a lack of technology gap that we are seeing in particularly in South East Asia. There are not, there is none flow battery manufacturer and we can uh, sense that there is an opportunity to scale our technology. So that was my primary motive, motivation to jump in and make this happen. So for me, um, entrepreneurship was kind of like an accidental discovery. Um, I joined the Accelerator Entrepreneur First just to learn a bit more about entrepreneurship. And then I met my co-founder, Amir, and it kind of happened one thing after the other. I always knew uh, that I wanted to make an impact. So um, before my PhD, I was actually working in an oil and gas industry. And I decided that this is not the future. This is not where I would want to spend my time into. So I moved to Singapore. I got my PhD in um, creating control algorithms on how to improve renewable energy systems efficiency. Right. So I created that for four years. I met Emir and I was pretty sure that uh, I want to keep working in this direction. I want to uh, keep contributing to it. And I truly believe climate change is the biggest problem of our generation. And if not us, then who? And that was one of the questions that led me to foundry saying, led me to build it where it are. It does not happen overnight. It kind of happens one thing after the other. Uh, it's uh, it's a thing that we learn mostly in PhD called incremental gain. You build on top of the giants that have come before you. And that's what we are doing as well, that we there have been like tremendous advantages in renewable energy technology. There have been tremendous advantages in battery technologies and even in control systems and uh, internet of things. How do we use them to solve one of the biggest problems of our lab things? And yeah, that's what led me to find found racing. I think uh, last two questions and then we end. I think one to Vishay Kumar sir would be, uh, Rahul asked this, can you give us some more information about how our lithium sulfur batteries in terms of efficiency and current problems that we are facing with these batteries? Uh, lithium sulfur, I mean, I, I have, I mean, I, I would say that I have not uh, explored lithium sulfur batteries a lot. I mean, I have knowledge of lithium ion, sodium ion, but not particularly lithium sulfur batteries. I will not be able to comment on, on, on that. Okay, thank you. I think last question to Jantika would be like, uh, finding a team is very important. So if, if someone wants to be an entrepreneur, should he or she be keep looking to find a team or should leave it to chance? Don't think you should leave to chance anything in life. 
if you have a control over what you can do to become an entrepreneur um, for me it was accidental but i would not leave things to chance it was a conscious choice to join entrepreneur first to meet with like minded people and yeah there was an eventual outcome that you can form a company out of it but there was also a possibility that i couldn't if you are really interested in entrepreneurship ask yourself the deeper question why why do you want to build a company why it can't be solved through conventional means and if you really think that yeah it cannot be solved through conventional means then yeah you are on the right track you are you don't leave it to chance you actively find things to find the answer and if you don't find the answer yeah then you you can leave and move on you need to identify right. a problem that you are solving if you are able if you have a problem that you think that you can solve it and nobody else is solving it you should do entrepreneurship but if company is doing it please please you to join a company it's always good okay. <laughs> thanks thank you for all your views i think uh we had two sessions back to back so we'll take a big break right now and we you can join us for our next session in 15 minutes i think so thank you for having me and if you are joining clean energy please join us when we are actively hiring also <laughs> yes please please check out the website so resync and vflow uh tech so thank you thank you for being here and xavier i think you can share your screen uh we'll be back in 15 minutes thank you thank you bye bye